Hello everyone, my name is Dr Alex Deacon and I'm a Senior Lecturer in the School of Law here at the Queensland University of Technology. I'm the coordinator of the QUT Global Law, Science and Technology Seminar Series, which brings together national and international speakers to explore the personal, societal and governance dimensions of solving real world problems, which are influenced by and through the interaction of science, technology and the law. I'd like to officially welcome you all here to today's seminar. It's very pleasing to see many participants from industry and from universities around Australia. This second seminar of our series in 2021 is the Blockchain Conundrum, Humans, Community, Regulation and Chains. You can find an abstract for the seminar in the information for this event. And this seminar will be a panel dis discussion with, with Associate Professor Felicity Dean, PhD candidate Lachlan Robb, uh, and chaired by Professor Kieran Tranter. Professor Tranter is Chair of Law, Technology and Future at the School of Law here at QUT. He researches the intertwining of law, technology and culture. His current projects focus on technologies of mobility, examining the accreditation of everyday autonomy and the complexities and complicities of technologies of mobility for First Nations justice and sovereignty. Felicity Dean is an associate professor here at the School of Law at QUT as well. Her current research projects intersect with a number of emerging areas, including technology, trade, and the environment. She's been a chief investigator on the Beef Ledger project since 2018. And Lachlan Robb is a PhD candidate in the School of Law at QUT, and he is exploring the role of technology and innovation upon blockchain projects through ethnography. The format for this seminar will be as follows. Uh, the panel will discuss the seminar topic for around 30 or 40 minutes, and then this will be followed by a Q&A session, which I'll chair. For the Q&A, if you wanna ask a question, you have a few options. You can select the participant bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, and select yes or the green tick in the participant window, or select the button to raise your hand uh, so I know that you want to ask a question or you can just post in the chat uh, and I can ask the question on your behalf. Uh, so I'll basically act as a chair uh, and call on you to ask your question or, or I'll ask it on your behalf and then the panel will respond and so on uh, for each question. As usual, I just request that you adhere to Zoom meeting etiquette by keeping yourself muted except uh, where you may be called upon to, to ask a question during the Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kieran Tranter now to open the panel discussion. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm going to start by just jumping into it. We're going to talk about blockchain. We're going to talk about blockchain a little bit differently. Uh, Lachlan and Felicity have particularly been engaged in a variety of projects that have involved both the helping uh, CRC related projects to build blockchain applications and blockchain uh, communities, but also in reflecting on the role of blockchain in developing human futures. And together we, we drafted some, some research, which is forthcoming in a, a journal called Law Innovation Technology, where we tried to start to crystallize some of our broader thinking around blockchain, blockchain within the cultural imaginary and blockchain within the uh, frame of how do we build futures and, and human centric futures. So to begin, of course, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners. Uh, we acknowledge the Turrbal and Yurigar as the First Nation owners on the lands where QUT now stands. We pay respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. We recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. And we acknowledge the important role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the, uh, the QUT community. Okay, today we're talking about the blockchain, blockchain conundrum. And I really need to begin with where we begin. The word chain invariably has really negative connotations. Chains bind and restrict. There's a notion of danger. Chains constrain vicious animals or hapless torture victims. 
Chains are associated with noisy, smelly, greenhouse polluting industrial machines. Chains have utility over aesthetics. Uh, the hanging chains, coiled, oiled, and rattling subtly in the breeze, set my soul at ease, could only be afraid from a dark dystopia. Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. You know, diving into s and subculture, chains connect with the human, but only in a form of a skewed conceptual play of domination and submission. In short, chains are not nice. A symbol and a tool of unbreakable constraint, a restriction on human agency and doing. Which is why all the hype and contestation around blockchain is really interesting. The digital is disrupting language as much as it is disrupting economies, abstract acronyms and reappropriated words and phrases have sneaked into the everyday from a variety of digital users. The idea that a word as ugly as blockchain would capture the cultural imagination is actually a study in itself. We are trying to take the chain in blockchain seriously. That blockchain presents as involving chains seems at odds with the libertarian enthusiasm of blockchain's crypto, uh, crypto uh, anarchist advocates. For them, blockchain presents as possibilities for freedom. Freedom from financial systems, freedom from established business models, freedom from the products of entrenched market players. Stated badly, there seems to be an Orwellian suggestion that in chains is freedoms. Yet this is the essence of the blockchain conundrum. Entwined in blockchain are these contradictory suggestions of total freedom and hard constraint. This is important for the practical task of building human-centric futures through and with blockchain. How blockchain is imagined in the present provides a horizon of possibilities for the future. The freedom constraint dyad of blockchain conundrum is actually the obstacle in the building of human-centric futures through blockchain. Uh, today, we suggest that the blockchain conundrum, this almost impossible dyad of freedom constraint can actually be overcome. But in doing so, we've got to start to unpack the cultural imaginary around blockchain. I will, what we're gonna talk about today, I'll begin by trying to unpack some of that cultural imaginary around blockchain. In particular, I'll talk about sort of the two broad cultural literatures that exist, both within the community, within various digital spaces, uh, and within the inter academic community. Broadly categorised, we refer, I refer to them as the hype literature around blockchain, and then a narrower and more focused critical literature. What I want to show is that both seem to articulate, although in a different way, this freedom constraint dyad of the blockchain conundrum. Lachlan will then go and explore in a more sophisticated way, the idea of regulation. The critical literature, unlike the hype literature, suggests that the notion of regulation can be a way out of some of the blockchain conundrum, although it tends to be very much within the context of very state-centric, top-down, regulatory requirements within the critical literature. We're going to take this idea of regulation, and Lachlan will, and explore some more sophisticated accounts of technology, regulation, and society as a way of thinking through and unpacking the blockchain conundrum. Felicity is then going to take though how we understood blockchain both as a form of regulation and a site of regulation and a way of building human communities to talk about the Beef Ledger project and the blockchain assemblage that the Beef Ledger project is trying to put together to create a community of human doing in the world. It's always good to begin with definitions of blockchain. Blockchain is not magic. It's a bit of code. It takes inputs and delivers outputs. The precise scope of applications that travel under the name blockchain is really diverse, ranging from Nakamoto's chain of blocks style, such as Bitcoin, through to more contemporary expressions such as distributed ledger technologies, the DLT, decentralized computers, uh, digital autonomous entities and others. Regardless of name and application, blockchain are often defined by three features. First, there's an idea of distribution word record or the ledger is distributed more widely than traditional central server authorities. 
Second is a sense or form of security derived from public-private encryption keys. And third is an idea of truth, where the system's acceptance of facts, transactions, and events is derived from a consensus mechanism such as proof of work or proof of stake. The combined effect of these features is that blockchain is seen as a digital archive that is arguably more secure, more immutable than traditional digital architecture. So as a bit of code that potentially enables distribution, security, and truth, there has grown around blockchain these substantial public discourses advocating its benefits. Within this hype literature, blockchain has been advocated, and I'm drawing upon some quotes, as an unhackable code, as liberating disruptive technologies, as the embodiment of anarcho-capitalist distrust of state-based currency systems and the mean to quick wealth. The tone and claims within this literature is often mosaic and euphoric. Blockchain can free society from the tyranny of the data overlords. Indeed, the potential benefits of blockchain are more than just economic, says some in the hype literature. It extends into political, humanitarian, social and scientific domains. Embedded in all these claims is the fundamental connection of, of blockchain with some idea of freedom. It is this idea that blockchain is freedom or is, is, is enabling a freedom that really defines the hype literature. Uh, while Bitcoin is not the first digital currency, the rationale for its creation and it stems from as appeal of a its appeal is as a mode of financial freedom in the wake of the GFC. Uh, it's this desire for financial freedom articulated within blockchain enabled uh, cryptocurrencies can be seen really strongly in the digital libertarian ideologies such as Hughes's cypherpunk manifesto and May's crypto anarchist manifesto. These narratives saw in blockchains features of distribution, security and truth, the possibility of absolute privacy and freedom from any government intervention. The framing of blockchain with financial freedom can also be seen in things like UN working paper documents, where blockchain, it was argued, could be used in developing countries to provide remittance services, banking, banking for the currently unbanked and a richer sense of financial, uh, richer sense of financial services. These aspirations are often echoed in initial coin offering white papers. And the idea of blockchain as freedom can be seen as built upon the dreams of these early, early cybernicus of the emerging digital, which saw it as a geography beyond the jurisdiction and reach of traditional sovereign actors. However, as with the 1990 cyber anarchists, the blockchain hype literature was also worried. And my favorite quote that's reappeared quite a lot in the hype literature, there, there, was a, there is a severe worry that the empire would strike back. That is the old oppressive institutions of the sovereign state and global finance would threaten the possible freedoms of a blockchain enabled future. It is the exploration adoption of blockchain technology by global finance that particularly within the hype literature began to be seen as a threat to blockchain as freedom. Initially global finance dismissed the hype around cryptocurrencies. JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, made multiple denouncement of Bitcoin as a fraud, as worse than tulip bulbs, etc. These made in within the literature a personification of the global finances pushback against blockchain as freedom. They were the epitome of what was wrong with banking. However, from 2017 onwards, the hype literature noted that global finance possessed another threat to blockchain as freedom, in blockchain conversely becoming colonized by global finance. Indeed, since 2006, JP Morgan has developed forum, private blockchain, and in 2019 launched its own digital currency. In this, JP Morgan, of course, is not alone with global finance and national financial institutions also developing blockchain-based fintechs. While some within the hype literature regard this as a threat, others regard it as a major milestone in the crypto world, with the potential that technology might make global finance more free from the inside. What can be seen is the hype literature is concerned with notions of freedom, but tied to anxieties of threat, control and constraint. But the hype literature is not the only public narrative engaged in blockchain. Where the hype literature can chase its origins back to the late 2000s, more recently a competing narrative has emerged. This critical literature tends to display a greater degree of sophistication than the bald claims and friend enemy logic manifest within the hype literature. Its origins come from multiple sources, the growing awareness of computing and environmental cost of Bitcoins, uh, the, the uh, outcome that a lot of the cryptocurrencies tended to be just maximizing the wealth of the wealthy and re 
reoccurring questions around Bitcoin's validity, effectiveness, or even accuracy. But the hype literature, this critical literature is also highly ideological. However, rather than its touchstone being just libertarian concepts and slogans, the critical literature tends to emanate from a really strong political economy location, connects blockchain, critiques, critiques of neoliberalism and digital capitalism. Generally, the critical literature considers the emergence and adoption of blockchain as another entrenchment of the privilege and wealth of the global elite through spawning greater levels of insecurity and competition, through transferring risk to the marginalized and the vulnerable. Furthermore, blockchain is argued through manifesting values of self-interest in the market is regarded as hostile and antithetical to broader ideals of inclusiveness and community mindedness. Ultimately, blockchain is, con is considered as contributing to a change in the mechanics of power from disciplinary to control societies, to quote, quote from one of the major uh, uh, critical literature authors, from the political economy of the panopticon to the informatics of domination. Granted as such, the critical literature is the antithesis of the hype literature. Where the hype literature sees blockchain as essential for human freedom against constricting institutions, the crit critical literature regards blockchain as a further set of chains binding the data served to the present, both ideologically and materially, the emergent satanic techno mills of digital capitalism. Human freedom and flourishing will become further limited constrained and owned through blockchain. But this dyad of freedom constraint is also manifest, although it's inverted. Rather than the promise of freedom threatened by constraint in the critical literature, blockchain is a constraint threatening freedom. However, the hype literature's response to the threat of constraint on blockchain uh, was either derision or uh, some sort of professing of a techno-determinist faith that blockchain will disrupt from the inside. The critical literature has a more programmatic response. And this is where we, we want to build upon the critical literature, although with a different, a different direction. Within the critical literature, regulation is often the idiom uh, and the concept deployed to be the, the form of constraint and to mediate the exploitive, exclusionary, and oppressive potential of blockchain. There are gradients. Some, some propose more contributing regulatory approaches where state agencies set standards uh, that are then incorporated and adopted through a cooperative regulatory process by the builders of blockchain systems. Others are more susceptible, uh, in particular Heron, who's one of the major uh, voices in the critical literature, suggests that the regulators have been co-opted by, in his language, the fairy dust of techno solutions, and you know, as they've brought up the hype literature's claims, um, and, are an and are unable and unwilling to deploy state power against blockchain the encouragement of blockchain-based fin checks through the use of sandboxes is his example of the regulators uh, being complicit to the desires of techno uh, digital capitalism. So for him, for Heron and other critical literature, we need harder forms of state control to, and democratically, democratic oversight to minimize the anti-social and anti-community effects of blockchain. However, what we've shown is this, the blockchain literature shows how the freedom and constraint dyad influences public framing. In the hype literature, it's all about human freedom threatened by constraint. In the critical literature, it's all about con constraint, uh, needing, needing constraint in order to maximize human freedom. However, regulation is not exhausted as seemingly in the critical literature by top-down state-centric solutions. The public discourse on blockchain can be seen as lacking some gradient. Between this vision of the free individual, which is in the hype literature, of choosing to engage in blockchain in order to be free, and state dictating constraint, which in the critical literature, there's a spectrum of influences and structures that mediate human conduct. This spectrum potentially sets out a broader scope for regulation than just imposed constraint or just top-down governing. This requires a more sophisticated vision of the entwining of law and technology in the proscribing of socially located human conduct. And it's here that I want to hand over to Lockie to start talking about some more sophisticated, uh, some more sophisticated visions of technology, society, and regulation, and in order of a way to frame how we're engaging with blockchain through Heath Ledger. So, thanks, Karen. Thanks a lot.
Um, so building on these ideas, we can turn to some theories to help better understand some of the forces at work here and to deepen our definition of blockchain and unpack the blockchain conundrum, as Kieran was saying. So I want to start off with Lawrence Lessing. Some of you may know him from his work Code 2.0 or Code 1. Um, and one of the things he introduces in this is the idea of the pathetic dot theory. This captures the technologically embedded human by showing how the dot, i.e. the human, is influenced and pushed by four types of forces. Law, social norms, the market, and architecture. Through those forces, that dot is influenced on all sides by structures that then guide, restrict, and open up avenues to act. Each of the forces work in tandem to influence any given situation, and the way they act with something like enforcement is important. So for instance, law is enforced when it's broken. If you don't pay for your morning coffee, the enforcement side starts when you know, the law states that was theft. You may or may not even know about the law, but you know, maybe thought the coffee was free, but regardless, if you broke it, it will still apply to you. However, look at, say, social norms. That changes a bit with knowledge. Let's say you got your morning coffee, but you were loud, rude, and you know, didn't say thank you to the barista. The enforcement is that they may scowl at you or, you know, et cetera, spell your name wrong next time. But knowledge comes into it. If you didn't know that was a norm, you didn't know of your breach. You, it didn't actually affect you. There was no enforcement because there was no knowledge because it's a social norm. Compare that, say, to architecture. Architecture represents the forces that apply at all times. They cannot be breached, regardless of knowledge or understanding. For example, the law of gravity, it's applied to all of us right now. It's applied to people long before figures like Aristotle or Newton ever gave it a name. It's the wall that stays standing. It's the locked door that remains locked, regardless if you knew it was even locked in the first place. And it's the chain that continues to constrict. That's the crux of the theory here. Lessig focuses on this and remains predominantly top down on regulation and the ways that laws, norms and market can force, uh, influence those building blockchains to actually comply with this greater good. It presents a world where the human is this dot. It's structured by influences that the dot has little authority over. There's a sense in that though that they're a powerless pawn who their conduct is predominantly predetermined by those forces. And it, you know, to continue the 2D metaphor of dots, it's, it's flat. What's missing is a contour in depth of how those structures actually interrelate. And that's where I want to turn to the work of Roger Brownsword. Because rather than focusing on the human as a dot, Brownsword's focus is where the public policy ends are identified and achieved through various means. Brownsword provides a more contoured location for actually thinking about these ideas like blockchain and regulation. His innovation here is to focus on how these established normative regulatory instruments, your laws, taxes, licensing, public education campaigns, etc., are being supplemented and actually replaced at times with what's known as technological management. This term refers to an ever-increasing nature of technology and actually act in this constitutive manner where it can actually prevent or disable or even compel certain types of actions and reactions. One of my favorite examples of this is that of the golf course and geolocking golf carts. So work with me here. There are patrons at a golf course who they want golf carts. They're tired of walking around. But the owner says no because he doesn't want them on the greens, which is fair. They agree though. Give us golf carts, won't drive on the greens. No problems for a while. Time goes past, but new people end up joining the club and they don't respect that gentleman's agreement of just don't drive it there. So the owner puts out an official rule. It is not allowed still occurs. Owner adds a penalty to discourage it. There's fines for damage, etc. Still occurs. There's loopholes that are exploited. No one can see the back nine, so therefore no one can really enforce it there. So he turns to technology. He installs cameras, but there's still loopholes. People realize they actually bribe the security guard monitoring the footage. The owner has enough, and he installs what's known as geolocking on his golf carts. That means they can now no longer actually be driven on the greens, or outside the boundary that the owner set up based on GPS. It removes the ability to actually breach the rule. So this evolution is a straightforward way of showing different types of rules and regulation as deployed socially. It starts as something referred to as a moral rule. Now, people won't do something because they know it's wrong and they wouldn't want to damage the property of the owner who they respect. 
But as time goes on, that same moral compulsion and respect is not reflected in new members. The community grows. This then has to evolve into a prohibitive rule, one of ought not and should not, which then develops that threat of punishment. Eventually through technology, it evolves into this full form of technological management as that ought not becomes a straightforward can not. They can no longer actually break that rule because a golf cart cannot physically be used in that way. The programming won't allow it. It's architecture. It's the same way that you can't stop gravity from acting on us, nor can you threaten an ATM with violence in the same way that a robber could threaten a real life bank teller. But say that golfer injured themselves on the green, say a dislocated knee, they need to be rushed to hospital. It'd be really useful to bring one of those golf carts right up to them, right? But the technology prohibits it, despite the fact it's an emergency. This is a rather reminiscent of the heart fuller debate and the argument of no vehicles on the, on the, in the park. And the point of the objects is that technological management can't actually deal with those hard cases. In this way, Brown saw its technological management has an affinity, although in a more nuanced way, with Lessig's code as architecture. From this perspective, Blockchain can be thought of as a target of regulation, as in the critical literature, which Kieran alluded to, and also as a tool itself in the regulation of human conduct. It has this dual characteristic. His argument is that technology should be seen as another possible instrument that regulators actually have in their arsenal. Unguided, though, a regulatory environment where technological management has entirely replaced normative tools has this corrosive effect on things like individuals' moral autonomy, choice-making, responsibility. This will not only further reduce the efficacy of normative tools, but potentially unravel the fabric of a moral community. To combat this, Brown Sword suggests there's a structure needed, which is what's known as a triple license. These are three areas that need to be considered in developing technology in this way. The commons license, which means relating to the foundational values of the uh, preservation of the commons. The community license is about making sure it's compatible with the fundamental values of that community. And then the social license, which means that it is there with a reasonable accommodation of the plurality of views within the community. It's a blueprint for, build, for building better futures through and with technology. The commons license, community license, and social license. Blockchain is a form of technological metric. As a piece of software, having the feature of distribution, security, truth, etc., it could be highly useful for technological management to actually achieve those regulatory ends. Ultimately, Brownsword's directive is progressive. The regulators should be building better human-centric futures through and with technology. And this is useful because it's not the naivety of the hype literature, the inherent good of unfettered technological disruption, nor is the state-centric control of a blockchain that seemingly is the end point for the critical literature. Rather, it's about the careful and considered articulation of desirable ends and regulatory means through working towards that triple license, amongst other things, to enable and protect individuals within flourishing, healthy communities. So what does that actually then practically mean? I now want to turn to Felicity to talk through examples of the blockchain-enabled community and beef ledger. Thank you so much, Lachlan. Um, so this presentation and this paper, it was really an opportunity to reflect back on thoughts, for me at least, about um, my journey with blockchain, my understanding of it, moving through from the fairy dust to these moral communities that will potentially, hopefully be developed through um, the Beef Ledger project. So to explain the Beef Ledger project, um, I've been working on it since 2018, which seems like a long time ago. It's an industry and um, tertiary institution collaboration. It's really based around the technology, but it has this particular use case being the beef supply chain, and in particular beef that's destined for being exported to China. So, the basis of the project is around, well, initially it was around two essential problems. Now, the first one is a reasonably significant problem and that's around food fraud. So we may trust our labels, we may take that for granted um, that, you know, what we buy from the shelf is what it says it is. But um, at the outset of the project, I actually interviewed, um, it was a large Brisbane distributor of restaurant products who suggested 
that over 50% of what their competitors, what their competitors, not them, what they sold, um, were not correctly labeled, that they were um, either, whether it was fraud or simply a mistake, they basically said it would be impossible for them to actually be selling what they say they're selling for those prices. Now, in China, this is potentially an even larger problem. So in 2019, um, I was fortunate enough to travel to Shanghai where we interviewed as, as a team, various restaurateurs some consumers, a lot of consumers, um, both young and old, uh, also distributors. And they all suggested that they only buy from certain companies or from certain people because it was all about trust and establishing trust. So this was the initial problem was around food fraud and, and being concerned with what we were buying was actually what it says it was buying. And this looked like something that you could potentially sprinkle on the fairy dust of blockchain to, to fix. Um, but there was another problem, of course, with the B supply chain that made this an interesting use case for blockchain. Um, and that, were the re that was the regulatory requirements in the beef supply chain uh, in Australia and also those destined for export. And I can see Lachlan nodding um, and he can speak to this very, very closely. Um, and I think he would probably use the word insane when he, if he, he was describing the standards, the guidelines, the laws and the reporting around the requirements for beef that's essentially going to be exported um, eventually. So Lachlan um, was fortunate enough to work with me on mapping the requirements of beef to be exported. And he presented on a use case for beef that was going through, I think it was three states that it went through. And it took him 30 minutes just to explain, you know, the process that this beef and the reporting that was required at each point along the supply chain. And just to talk through these basic requirements, and then the fact that there, these records were not being properly kept really indicated that there were these weaknesses in the supply chain as well. And again, this looked like something that you could take that fairy dust, you know, the hype around blockchain, sprinkle it on and potentially let's look at fixing this. So the Beef Ledger project essentially looked at these problems. They said, well, how can we make it better through a software application? You know, how can we take something that is seemingly um, you know, magical initially, not that they necessarily thought that, it was perhaps I'm um, reflecting on my thoughts around it. Um, how can we make this software do something that will, that will make this better for everybody involved? And initially it was about removing the humans and really looking at drawing back on that, um, the idea of Lessig and the pathetic, pathetic dot theory, removing the humans and saying, well, let's make it so that we force them to behave in certain ways. Let's make the architecture, um, you know, take away choices in this. Let's make the architecture stronger because the laws around this are not sufficient. Um, the laws were clearly not enough. But there was a problem with, with doing this, and this is essentially coming back to the locking of the golf cart as well. The, the sheer volume and the complicated nature of removing the human from the decisions along the beef supply chain and eliminating the chance of any fraud, it was nearly impossible and not necessarily desirable when you consider um, Brown Sword's considerations of the importance of um, morality in human decision making. So essentially over time, um, a, a different approach was adopted. Um, you know, we have these laws and it was accepted that we have these laws. They set the bare minimum. What we need to do is build a community where there is an incentive to do more, where standards can essentially exceed the bare minimum. So the ends can be achieved still, you know, the elimination of food fraud in certain instances, I, I dare say it will never be completely eliminated, but the elimination of food fraud, you know, making it easier to comply with regulatory requirements, these ends can still be achieved, but through different means. We don't necessarily have to lock the golf cart. So this supports using the technology as a tool um, for these outcomes to bring people together rather than removing them from the equation entirely, rather than removing their decisions from the equation, let's bring them together. 
not a surveillance or as invading privacy, but to allow the community to participate in the management of itself. And ultimately, um, removing any needs for excessive enforcement because they'll do it themselves. So making the job of the regulator essentially easier. So the consensus and the sharing mechanism that blockchain technology supported was therefore fulfilling a function of making morals, decision making and higher standards more visible. Um, which brings me to this idea that the watched or those being um, monitored, they were to become the watchers rather than needing always um, to regulators to enforce things. And this was a point we actually made in one of our earlier papers um, around the Panopticon, um, which I think Lachlan was going to talk about now. Um, but yeah, so what Felicity was saying is that um, what we started to see was that there's this building up of the community response, which then looked a lot like Panopticism, the Panopticon, which is a uh, the how do you put it um uh creation of bentham and refinement by foucault if you want to follow it that way um but the idea is that you would then have this central location which would then be able to monitor and see into all the participants within the system and that it's not just about surveillance, it's just about observation, but the idea is that you don't actually know when that central tower is able to actually see you. That then instills in the watched, the ability to then not know when they're being watched. So they need to always adopt the attitude that they are always being watched, regardless of what's happening, which then reduces the need for that central tower to actually monitor all the time because there's this uncertainty. If you know that you're always being watched, you will, but it takes a lot of energy. Like for example, I know when we went through China, one of the things that fascinated me was seeing on the highways, there was always flashing lights happening every now and then, which made me think of, you know, speed cameras, but obviously weren't going off all the time, but you're not quite sure, is that them watching me, is that not? There's always someone with a camera, you don't know if it's recording, but there's that level of surveillance to where you're not sure, so you should just behave just in case. So the way this comes into the beef ledger stuff is because the system is then passing on, um, you know, there's reporting all throughout, but as the beef moves from the, um, from the feedlot through to the um, production, through processing, through to shipping containers, and then to the final consumer, at each point, people are then reporting in what's happened. And that altogether means that there's this chain of information which can then mean that when someone at the end point scans the food it then verifies back to the staff that yes that is what i think it is yes it came from the right location no there's no biosecurity issues involved etc and that by having each participant actually voluntarily put the information in we're starting to get this community developing where they're all kind of watching each other and mm -hmm. it's something which can then allow for the regulators to jump into if they need to to enhance but it then reduces their need to actually always be in that tower it reduces the need for it to happen because that information is there so what we then start to see is not just this negative attitude of panopticism as surveillance as something which is always watching which we see a lot in your um surveillance studies literature but we can actually have the blockchain replicate these same mechanisms, but to enhance higher standards. So most production, most people engaging in life, let alone in this sort of area of cattle production, they're not engaging with the law in every day where they're breaking the law. They're not, they're not always doing things wrong. So they, the panopticism would normally apply to this basic minimum, the did you poison everyone? Yes, no. It doesn't apply all the time, but what everyone is doing all the time is they're holding themselves to higher standards. They're making sure the animals are treated well. They're feeding them the cattle chocolate to make sure they've actually, I can't remember the scientific reason for it, but I remember that happened. <laughs> um, they're doing all these great things. There's the carbon offsetting. There's all these things which aren't actually engaged in law, um, but it's all part of this economic reasons to why people may want to do it or ethical reasons to why people may want to choose that. So by having this same system, let them report on those other things they're doing, it is still this panopticism of watching 
and watchers being the watchers watching, but it duplicates that system. So you have the basic minima panopticon, but then you have this higher standards. So everyone can slowly start to set where they want that level to be at to actually improve society as a whole within this economy and within this sort of society and community. And I'm probably yeah. going to step into an area that I'm not completely comfortable in when I go and talk about the panopticon. But um, when we wrote about this initially, well, my first thought was, um, what the hell is a panopticon when um, Lachlan mentioned it? But in learning about it, you could see the, the progress of Bentham from the initial, the prison example, um, then to the pauper example, um, um, my memory's fading on the third one, but it eventually led to the constitutional panopticon, where the people were essentially empowered by it. And this is, a sen this is really the idea behind um, the blockchain beef ledger project is to empower the community that's involved in it. That means that they don't have to fear the law necessarily um, because they can become the watchers of each other. And to draw on Lachlan's point, it can encourage these higher standards, even to the point of driving more safely, um, which is good for the animals, for animal welfare. You know, these, a lot of these um, standards are not necessarily enforced. And the idea was, well, this can potentially come about through this mechanism. Yeah, because one of the big things in with that driving point was that um, we were trying to investigate is the was the speed and the nature of the truck drivers um, does that affect the stress levels of the cattle and does that affect the finished product as well and the big point there is that well no one can really ever track exactly what the cars are doing at all points you have an empty road where there's no surveillance whatsoever you could have a road where there may be a speed camera or a policeman there who will track the speed and you know enforce it as dangerous driving or you can go the full other end of it, technological management side of things, where you actually get little kits that go into the trucks, which will then actually track the speed and therefore report back as to when they actually go over. And that's great from a business perspective, you can see these things, but it starts to cross a few interesting lines if you then start you know, publicly putting it into a blockchain that truck driver A went 112 Ks over this spot, which therefore technically is illegal, and now you broadcast it publicly. So trying to find where that middle ground is to then be able to encourage best behavior without inadvertently reporting illegal activities or you know crushing the wills of the truck drivers to where they don't actually want to drive for you anymore. It's that interesting little area in between which a lot of this sort of technology is then trying to feed into. Kieran, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I probably do if I can turn my mic off. <laughs> Look, the key thing, the key thing that you and um, Felicity have brought out, both in the immediate paper and the broader work, is this idea of blockchain as facilitating community. Um, and so while the, the dominant public narratives are all about either individuals being completely free to spend their cryptocurrency to buy Teslas, and or, um, you know, the, ne the necessity of the state to come in and, and restrict uh, blockchain for the public good. What we're really, I admit, what you've really uncovered in the work in the Beat Ledger, which is innovative inherently because we are starting to try to put, um, and this is your PhD, look, we're trying to start to put a digital, a digital solution that is in fact an assemblage uh, product in the sense that it's assemblage of this cow, this meat, there's that meat space that has to be mirrored in the digital, um, which, which makes it a, a much more complicated uh, event. But what in particular, that, that in itself is, is, is fascinating. But what was really fascinating, the way you guys talk about the Beef Ledger uh, project is all about this idea of community, that this doesn't work of an individual and it doesn't work by being state century it works by being generated by people as a way of structuring how they want to go about things and that is that is quite unusual uh in the literature on technological regulation and the literature on on on, on blockchain 
Um, and so it was really good for you to bring that out. And of course, it's really good also you to, 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 to engage in the rehabilitation of the Panopticon. Ever since David Lyons um, wrote uh, The Electric, Electric Eye and established the balance studies of the discipline, uh, the idea of the Panopticon has come back into the public, into broader intellectual context, but it's normally come back in a very negative sense. Uh, it, it's normally been influenced by a very uh, liberal perspective that surveillance is bad, panopticon structures are bad, which of course wasn't at all Bentham's approach. Bentham, of course, is not a liberal. Bentham wants to build healthy societies uh, and deal with individuals uh, that are problematic to that healthy society. And so it was. it's really good to see you starting to then not just fall for as often happens in the in the blockchain literature, both both the critical and the uh, the hype that panoptic types of balance is wrong or or bad, but instead panoptic surveillance is immicable. It exists. It, it's 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 a tool to assume, It's a way to understand how humans respond by being watched. It can be a very good thing, you know. CCTV cameras going or not have unproblematically made environments safer for women and children um, in public space. Um, but this is a good thing. And so it's really good to start seeing that more sophisticated engagement with the panoptic, the tradition of the panoptic and the idea of surveillance as not just an inherently negative thing, but as something that we should, something that we humans uh, respond to in ways that if we want to build human centric futures, we should be aware and take advantage of that, that part of human, human conduct. So that was, that's, that, that's a really wonderful part of, of what you guys have been doing. I just had one more bit before we open up to questions. Um, just going on what Kieran was just saying then around how this is building the human centric side of it. I think one of the fascinating things that has come out of some of my research is that there are these tensions between what tech people see, what coders do, and then what blockchain coders are doing. So I guess one of the examples of this is it's the concept known as code as law or code is law, where you then have people who will hack into something because, you know, if there's an error, it's their right, their duty to exploit it because there's an error. That is the law. If there's a hole in it, they can exploit it without it being a problem. And one of the early examples of this in blockchain was with the DAO hack, which happened in 2016, where I think 500 million US dollars or something was siphoned out of the system um, by someone exploiting it. But what was fascinating was that they had about, was it two weeks to then actually decide what they were going to do about the system before he could convert the money from Ethereum into actual fiat currency. And what happened was everyone together as a community kind of had to decide, do we want to roll back those transactions? Because it's all code, they could do it, they could just rewrite the ledger if they all got together, or did they let him have it? And actually split into kind of two different camps. Um, it split into two different camps because you then had people who didn't want the system to let him get away with it, and you had people who were then saying, well, actually, the exploit was there. Technically, he followed the rules at that time. And that is just an interesting ethos within technology development and the way that people actually approach coding. And it's something which I haven't been seeing a lot of in blockchain coders. You don't have quite so much um, single-minded, egotistical expressions of code as law, more that this code is something which can actually then build this human-centric future. It's about putting the people back in. You engage a lot in this space when you look at technology and law with you know automation machine learning it's all about you know removing the person it's all about replacing the person but the blockchain despite the fact it seems so chain driven and cold and heartless it actually does seem to be something where people are designing ways to put people back in and that's fascinating improving the moral structure of the community rather than eroding it yeah. Right, That's well, a great place to end, Felicity. Thanks. Sorry, Alex. No, no, you're right. Thank you very much, Lachlan, Kieran, and Felicity.
that was a, a really fascinating discussion and I'm sure it's raised uh, a lot of questions. So we'll move to the Q&A session now. Just a reminder, uh, you can indicate uh, as a participant whether you want to ask a question uh, or not, uh, or you can shoot through uh, your question through the chat and, and I'll get that and then ask the question on your behalf, or we can feel free to do it more organically and people can just unmute themselves and, and ask their question. So I'll open it to the floor. Thank you. John, John Flood has a question. <laughs> Of course. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was that was fascinating. Um, now I, I want to complicate things a little bit for you because I think um, to some extent uh, you, you've taken um, well, Lachlan has, and I think you by uh, um, extension have taken a kind of binary approach to this, uh, uh, which is to disaggregate different kinds of technologies and 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 talk about them independently of each other. Whereas in actual fact, I think what we have to do is start thinking about these things as conglomerations, if you like, or assemblages to use the uh, uh, current word, um, and, and then how they uh, impact on each other. So uh, the first point I would make is that uh, I don't think there's any difference between technology and uh, coronavirus, for example. They are both uh, viral in nature, which means that they have a desire to reproduce themselves um, and, and uh, uh, seek to spread themselves as, as far as possible. Um, and, and when I say that about technology, I, I mean all forms of technology. So um, you know, I'm working on a book on the Internet of Things at the moment. And it seems to me that most people think of the Internet of Things as being sort of associated around machine learning, artificial intelligence, and things like that. Again, that's a rather simplistic view of the uh, uh, Internet of Things. What it seems to me is, is more likely is an Internet of Things, which is a combination of uh, AI and blockchain. Um, we are going to be in situations where um, the state may have a monitoring role, but it won't have an active role in that way. So if we want to get involved in road pricing, you, you do transport, so you know, uh, and things like that, we need to be able to reward people as well as penalize people for using roads at particular times of, of day. Um, a blockchain through a system of uh, micropayments has the capacity to do that kind of thing, more so than uh, uh, any kind of AI at the moment. Now that then brings it back down to the community level, which is what um, Lachlan was saying. And, uh, but of course, at the same time, it also means that the surveillance of, of people is intensified. Um, and, and, and to me, that's an inevitability. I, I, unfortunately, we are going to live, I think, in a, uh, a society where the pantechnicon is not going to be utopian, it's not going to be terribly benign, it's going to be um, uh, uh, quite the opposite. I think it's going to be malign, I think it's going to be used to control people. Um, but what I do see is the potential for blockchain in some ways to get us out of that in, in all respects. So if we don't need to just use AI to, to uh, uh, um, observe people and discern what their emotional states are and things like that, but we can integrate blockchain as a way of enabling people to work in a highly technological community, which is very interconnected, that would remove you somewhat from that. So actually I see blockchain as a kind of um, potential savior if you like. I'm not seeing it as utopian, but I see it as, as having a, a, a role which can perhaps guard us against some of the uh, iniquities and evils of AI because it is operating on this peer-to-peer -peer basis. Thank you. Thanks, John. Look, I think, I think we're unsurprisingly much on the same page. A um, couple of things you wrote, you, you mentioned here, yeah, I think you're entirely right. We to to focus on blockchain as a standalone thing is like focusing perhaps on a spark plug in the context of the internal combustion engine. You know, yeah, we talk about the internal combustion engine and the and the the forms of mobility and systems dealt down by that. We don't talk about the spark plug per se. You know, we don't talk about the, we don't talk about the spark plug and law. We talk about 
the car and law and regulation and mobility. In the, in the same way, I think what we've seen is particularly in the academy, uh, but particularly in the entrepreneurial space, people fastening upon a particular uh, cultural imaginary of a technology as a, as, as a thing that they can see some strategic advantage in promoting. So whether it's an entrepreneur saying, I've got the blockchain solution for X, or whether it's it's a uh, an academic who wants to say, I'm gonna do the definitive work on blockchain and X, Y, and Z. I think we need to be talking more about the digital and the digital involves uh, clusters and complexities of blockchain, AI, machine learning, various you know we're going to have quantum coming soon oh, god knows what that's going to involve um which isn't the digital i suppose but we we're talking about sort of sort of automated informatics as the as the zone as the primary zone of of the economy and human life um and so i i think you're exactly right that in our work so far because felicity and lock are doing a very particular and obvious blockchain entity with B. Fletcher, and we were responding to very much the blockchain hype literature and the blockchain academic literature in that regard. Now, there is, of course, some good work to be done on it's all just the whatever we're going to call this collective, the digital, the informatic or whatever, um, and it has different, it, and each, each component of that has different roles and complexities, but we should keep them, think about them together. I think your uh, your your point, I think, is exactly uh, where we've come to too, which is blockchain has potential to build human-centered things, possibly in opposition to some of the more um, uh, authoritarian tendencies, particularly at AI and our cultural imaginary of the AI as God. Um, as the total control, as the knower of all. Um, and uh, that's what, what we were trying to bring out in our, in our, in our work. Um, so while the hype literature would always be, you know, I am the Messiah appointed by, by, by the digital to make myself lots of money. Um, and the critical literature is, you know, blockchain is part of the, you know, the devil digital capitalism and it's coming to get us all and, and make our life even more miserable, precarious and more miserable. Uh, we're trying to say, no, it's a system that has possibilities that can be built to create human central futures. futures. Is it easy? No. Is it, is it inevitable? No. But we need to be a bit more nuanced and sophisticated in how we assess how these technologies can be deployed to, 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 to create structures for human flourishing or otherwise. I just wanted to say, I don't want to speak for you, Kieran, but I feel like that was almost the starting argument for this whole paper was that it's just software, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't respond to all of this, this hype, you know, it, it isn't the fairy dust, it isn't magical. And it's also, it's not the devil either. And so let's just look at how it's used. It's essentially just software and it's going to form one tool amongst obviously many. Oh, we have a, I've had a question come through the chat. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, blo blockchain is not uh, public, which I assume means it's not a public entity. And so is it really meaningful to, to speak of community in this context? Uh, let's see a lot. Do you want to respond to that? I can stand plus he can fix what I say. <laughs> um, so I guess, I mean, that almost just comes into what um, Karen, John and Felicity were just saying then. It's that it itself is not, I, mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by public, but um, it builds communities. It can build um, people and connections around the use of the technology. So, for example, the Beef Ledger community built are uh, those participating in the blockchain and that creates people who come together, who share things across, who then start building this connection and trust and dependability and knowledge of one another enabled through that technology. And that then brings together this full assemblage, which is all different types of technology and all different types of people, which you can as a whole call a community. 
um, yeah. I would just say that, you know, it, well, the Beef Ledger Project, the idea is it's, it's a voluntary association. So people who are, you know, in that, who are part of the beef supply chain can essentially become involved in it. Um, through various means that are not involved in the commercial side of things, but it is open in that respect. But um, I don't think that community means that it needs to be open to the world at large. You know, you can have communities that are very distinct um, that can drive your morality in different ways. And that's the idea behind this one. Okay. Um, can I add to that? Thanks guys. Um... That was my question, actually, and I thought I might take the floor. I'm not sure how much time we've got here. First of all, I wanted to say thank you very much for that. Um, that distinction between the hype and the critical literature, that's really great because there is a lot of hype out there. And I think a lot of people do not understand what blockchain is and what it can do. And that's why I'm asking those sorts of questions because nobody can connect to it. And I wonder how many people have volunteered for the Beef Ledger project. Felicity, you said that you're not part of the commercial, so maybe you don't know, I don't know. Um, it would be interesting to know, because as you probably know, I'm onto the textile side of it, wanting to get people involved in it, but it's very, very cumbersome to get into um, and to, you know, enter data and to become part of it. And it costs money, at least crypto money. Um, and it seems like, why bother? That would be my final question, otherwise we could go on and on. So I'll, I'll just build on that a little bit. So I guess it really depends on your the type of blockchain you're looking at. A lot of the most common ones will be built on Ethereum, where to add stuff through, add transactions through, you obviously have to pay using their cryptocurrency to then push the transactions through. It's the fuel that makes it go. Um, the Beef Ledger one in particular, it uses its own in addition to Ether. So it depends on as it then rolls out in full, it can then be independent from block um ethereum's blockchain um but as far as being able to participate in it literally anyone with the smartphone can actually add new information in there without actually being cumbersome you can usually just add new data in you don't have to download the um the you don't have to download any new programs you don't have to be a holder of the decentralized um uh, record you can literally just add new information out as anything you can also sign up to be a node if you wanted to um, and that's the idea of a, as you get more invested in it, if you are a government body, if you are any of these sorts of things who want to play a more active part, you can just become a node, which is then more of a dedication of software and equipment. But it then means that you're another one of these participants who can then hold on to and therefore increase the reliability of the system and make it more decentralized. The idea is that it will build over time. And it is fascinating to see this stuff as it grows, as it moves through this, you know, alpha stage of concepts through beta programs and initial applications to what it actually does become as these things all come through. And just to respond, I don't think it really answers your question, Hilde, about how many people have um, become a part of it. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I do know that things have been slightly um, disrupted in a, less than positive way um, due to COVID and various other issues around um, the beef supply chain at the moment. So um, we certainly haven't been able to make connections in China as, um, as Warwick, um, as the chairman would have originally intended. So I think that's been um, one of the things that may have held things up slightly, but it's having said that, I don't know how many people are involved in the community at all. Um, okay. but, yeah. Yeah, Lachlan, one more question. So you say that anybody can jump onto the Beef Ledger, the Smart Trade Networks right now, me? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, I'll give it which, a try, thank which you. Which raises different questions as to <laughs> who is involved and why and what the purposes are. Yeah. yeah. But one of the theories or mentalities behind it, I guess, is that everyone can potentially join, but until you can prove yourself to be part of a particular function or a level of reliability what you do will be more heavily scrutinized so for example if you were to suggest i have 20 cows coming from this place or this place you will need to upload a lot of supporting information and there will have to be a large portion of the community to verify that that is true but as you become more established that yes you are that you are reliable nothing you're doing is dodgy 
less people will need to then verify that. And the idea is that it is all this community in that it will respond naturally to where it places trust and how reliable different entities are within it. So if you were to create a hundred different entities and try and spam the system and you keep getting booted out, your level of reliability is going to be at the minimum level the whole time through and the system will theoretically respond to those sorts of threats. Mm. So the other participants kind of have to be on the blockchain all the time to check up on me? Well, it depends on who's in there. So when you were to, so in the same way that if you were to transact a Bitcoin, you put it out there and the miners will then approve it, chuck into the next transaction and move through. For a system like blockchain, you will say, I have 20 cows from this place to this place. Here is a photo. Here is some Excel spreadsheets, yada, yada. It doesn't automatically get added in in the next 15 second block, it has to wait until it gets a level of approval. So this is all this governance internal system that a blockchain can then put in place. And that's why somewhere like Bleep Beef Ledger has built their own blockchain to then add these rules where they need to see them rather than purely using something transact transaction based like a cryptocurrency, like Ethereum or Bitcoin. Thank you. All right, all right everyone, we are out of time. So we'll have to finish up there. Thank you for, for coming today and participating. I think it was a really informative and, and lively and interesting discussion, and I hope that everyone benefited from it. I'd particularly like to thank Professor Kieran Tranter, Associate Professor Phil City Dean and Lachlan Rock for contributing their time and their expertise. Our next seminar in this series will be in July. So uh, once again, thank you for participating, and I look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you.